Recently, there's been a media storm about Chief Justice Mukwege's comments about law and religion. We go to Parliament where I speak to ACDP MP Steve Swart about the growing anti-Christian bias in the liberal media and also the hypocrisy regarding religion and secularism. I'm speaking to ACDP MP Steve Swart here in Parliament, right outside the old Assembly building. And Steve, as an attorney and a member of the Justice Portfolio Committee, I thought it was appropriate to talk to you about the Chief Justice comments recently in which he said that religion could strengthen our laws. There's been, as you know, a huge outcry from the liberal media mainly about those comments, um, a lot of it distorting what he said. But do you agree with what he said? Absolutely. We from the ACDP are fully behind the Chief Justice. And you recall, even when he was nominated and he said he was going to pray about whether he should accept this position or not, he was widely criticized and he was given a really robust questioning by the Judicial Services Commission because of his faith and because of his beliefs. We feel very strongly, and it is, and as he said, our law is very strongly based on religious beliefs. If you take the common law of England, for example, it is based on the Ten Commandments. If you take our laws, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit murder, it is illegal in terms of our law as well. So there are many aspects of religion that is contained in our law at the moment, and we think it is fundamental and good of the Chief Justice to have expressed those views. He's not saying our law should be based on specific texts, but what he is saying is religion underpins the values of our society and the values of our law. And we need to look at that. He's saying we're faced with maladministration, corruption, officials not doing their jobs, and surely there's a place for religion to be factored into our law. So whilst I can't speak uh, officially on behalf of the Justice Committee, we as the ACDP most certainly do support his sentiments as he has expressed. Now, now what do you say to the critics that uh, have said that South Africa is a secular state and that religion has no place in our lawmaking processes? Well, that is interesting. The Constitutional Court has already said that the religious beliefs of a large majority of South Africans must be taken very seriously. So they are on record as saying that. We've had that same debate here in Parliament, whether South Africa is in fact a secular state or not. I beg to differ. If one looks that you can have religious observances in state institutions, that would mean that we do not have a strict separation of church and state and a strict secular state. There's no clause that says South Africa is a secular state. So there's a lot of dispute about that and different views about that. In the Western Cape, for example, we've got the Western Cape Constitution that says in humble submission to Almighty God, we the people of the Western Cape, and that has been accepted by the Constitutional Court. We have the debates here in Parliament often in our Constitutional Review Committee as to whether we are a secular state or not. People saying if we are a secular state, all references to God in the Constitution must be removed. We as the ACDP have fought that and asserted that we are not a secular state and broad-based across political lines they've accepted that and so they have refuted those submissions that say we must remove all references to God in our constitution. Now um, I made the argument on a radio debate program on SAFM recently that we might have a secular constitution but more than 80 percent of South African citizens subscribe to one religion or the other so you know Christianity being the largest. How can we be a secular state if so many people in the country are religious? Well, absolutely, but it gets down to the text of the Constitution. That is what the liberal people are saying, and that is what, what is paramount almost. But I agree with you. And if you take a look at a lot of our laws that do reflect the religious values, take, for example, the defense of moderate parental chastisement that exists in our common law at the moment. Yes, again, that is now being attacked, but it exists in terms of our law where parents can moderately chastise their children, can apply moderate discipline. That is permissible in terms of our law. That is based on scriptural references, on religious references, spare the rod and spoil the child. So yes, there is a lot of grounds, and your point is 100% correct, that if there are 80% of South Africans that hold different faiths, different religions, mainly Christian, surely those values should be translated into our society and into our lawmaking process, and we as the ACDP fully support that. Now, now Steve, 
Um, when I read the speech of the Chief, Chief Justice, one of the things that, that caught my attention was that he was speaking specifically about marriage and family. Institutions, as you know, that are breaking down in our society because uh, the laws that have been passed since 1994 in this institution, Parliament, has not done a lot to protect and defend those institutions. And he was saying um, uh, behaviors like um, um, uh, fornication, yes. adultery, yes. Uh, divorce, are all things that the law should frown on. Why? Because we want to protect marriage and family. One, we want to strengthen these institutions. The media came out against him. How can that be wrong to protect marriage and family in a country that is ravaged by the consequences of family breakdown? Absolutely, and I would fully support you on that. And we as the ACDP have fought for almost 20 years to protect family values, to protect the family, which is the center. Healthy families are healthy communities, healthy societies. And we see it being broken down by secularist, humanist agendas where anything goes. You have relativism. If you don't have absolute values that are often founded on faith and on religions, you have relativism. Anything goes. Therefore, you can have, as we see a breakdown uh, in, in our marriages, we can have same-sex marriages, you can have abortion on demand, you can have children having contraceptives at the age of 12, uh, abortions without parental uh, guidance, all these things that are a, an attack on our basic values on our religious values and of course as we as um, our Judeo-Christian values. So we need to take a strong stance and yes we've got the support of the population here. We've got 80 percent of people across religions that stand. I remember when we opposed the same-sex marriage issue all faiths came out and they said we are opposed to this. Yes there were one or two Christian faiths, uh, church members that agreed with it, but they were in the minority. But overwhelmingly, if you remember the marriage alliance that came out strongly representing millions of people that said we cannot accept this. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is support out there. There's support in there, and that needs to be translated into putting pressure on our government and on parliament to ensure that the laws we pass have that Judeo-Christian basis and are not impacted by secular humanism. And we see even in the media today, uh, over the weekend, uh, Mondi, Mondi Makanya, who that came out supporting the Chief Justice, where he in fact urged us to be careful of anti-religion fundamentalists. Mm. Those, he said, those zealots are more dangerous, are more because they would try to picture us as Christians as for almost a form of backwardness, primitiveness, mm. almost virgin on witchcraft whereas we stand strongly for our faiths that have stood the test of time mm. and that have formed the backbone of our laws. I'm a lawyer. I've studied law. Our common law is strongly impacted by our religious faiths over the years, and that has stood the test of time. And so I commend the Chief Justice. I commend Mondli Makanya of the City Press for coming out in support of the Chief Justice and saying, let us be aware of anti-religion fundamentalists that are trying to introduce secular humanism, particularly where the majority of South Africans hold to a religious belief and that those beliefs should be factored into our lawmaking process. I fully support that. And what do you say about uh, a news channel in South Africa that interviewed a legal expert and asked him this question? Um, should the Chief Justice, is the Chief Justice at least, fit for high office considering his Christian beliefs. Now, the line of questioning suggests that in any South African citizen that is a Christian and has biblical beliefs is not fit for public office. What is your comment on that? If that was put in Parliament, it would be disallowed. Absolutely. Why should the fact that one is a Christian dis allow you to stand for high office. I think that is disgraceful. And of course, one needs to bear in mind that the Chief Justice himself went through a rigorous questioning by the Judicial Services Commission. They found him more than able to hold high office. So who is this interviewer to say that once the Judicial Services Commission has gone through the process, has appointed a Chief Justice, found him to be more than fit and able, and Parliament and the President have adhered to that. Who is this person to question him for his standing? Yeah, and I think it's uh, the, the anti-Christian bias in the media that uh, has been exposed uh, during this whole uh, debate about the Chief Justice and his comments 
that religion strengthened our lawmaking process uh, in South Africa. But Steve, I want to thank you once again for speaking to us at Watchman on the Wall. Uh, we are very excited and um, pleased that you're back in Parliament to continue the fight for Christian values, uh, to protect the family and advance the kingdom of God in this important institution. Thank you, Errol, and thank you for the opportunity. And, and we just want to commend you for being watchman on the wall. We are watchmen on the wall within Parliament. You are watchmen on the wall outside Parliament. So let's take hands to further the kingdom here in Parliament and in South Africa. Thank you so much. But it got to the point where immediately after the president made his preferred candidate for appointment known, that people in the public domain began to you know, speak as if I was never considered by them as a possible appointee to the position of Chief Justice. You would recall that some of the comments went like a surprise or a shock nomination of Mohueng. But the focus was primarily on my Christian belief. Uh, what is his attitude going to be about the gay and lesbian community? The Constitution guarantees their rights. Is he going to be keen to ensure that their constitutional rights are, are upheld as much as other constitutional rights are given? The, the recognition and the protection that they deserve. Fortunately for me, and it may not make sense to you except you are a Christian, from as far back as 2004, we had, there was a crusade in Mafiking at the Civic Center. A man by the name uh, Richard Gray came from Peter Marisberg. He's still alive. I went to see him the other day. He's young. Called me and said, you are a judge, aren't you? I said, yes. And he said, the Lord says you're going to be the Chief Justice of South Africa. 2004 already. I laughed it off. But the more I fasted and prayed, the more I got confirmation of this prophecy from many other men of God. From London, Ghana, Nigeria, Washington, D.C. It really became so real that I had to regularly go on a fast just to retest the veracity and the authenticity of the, of the prophecy. A week before I was actually nominated, one man of God, Prophet, uh, no, not Prophet, Apostle Elvis Achiambo, sent me an email and said, you know, my wife and I were praying this morning. The Lord says, you are about to be elevated. So when the storm came, I had the benefit of the 2009 baptism of fire that went a long way towards helping me develop what is ordinarily or loosely referred to as the third skin. I had tapped into the extraordinary capacity I never knew I had to withstand the worst of challenges. But more importantly, as the storm gained momentum, from Monday to Wednesday, I would go on a dry fast. I wouldn't take water, I wouldn't take food, 24 hours. Of obviously based on the kind of scriptures that you need when you're involved in a spiritual warfare. And that stood me in good stead. Additionally, I think a week or so before the actual interview, God used the same man of God to give a message, and I've got them all in, in the emails, to say relax and be calm. For a miracle is about to hit you. So I went there restfully in command of the situation. We were enjoying the kind of peace that doesn't make sense, my wife and I, and all my children. So we saw it more as an opportunity to demonstrate that God is very much alive, and if you're faithful and surrendered to him, and if it is not an ambition that you are pursuing, but a God-given vision that you are pursuing, he will protect you, irrespective of how many millions happen to be opposed to your nomination or appointment based either on their logic or the desire to further self-interest, uh, sectoral interest, or just sheer opposition 
to the very uh, Christian faith that you happen to subscribe. So, so would you say these prophecies helped you prepare you for the storm that came? Absolutely. The baptism of fire in 2009 and the inner assurance that, you know, this is not something that I went out of my way looking for in pursuit of an ambition or a, a selfish interest. This is what God wants me to do. That is why in the course of the interview, which, as you know, was live, when I was asked, well, we heard from one of your colleagues that you say the Lord wants you to be chief justice, which people continue to make mockery of to date. I had no hesitation in saying, as a matter of fact, it is so. Additionally, if you look at my response to the allegations that were leveled against me, my written response, I quote from the Bible because I was sure that I was doing or pursuing the will of God. And that is why notwithstanding the intensity of the opposition, not just from the country, but from all over the world, the prophecy of God, who never lies, prevailed. Amen. And we were shocked by some of the common comments in the newspaper. Some um, people that call themselves experts, constitutional experts, even went as far as saying that Christians should not hold the job of chief justice. And a, a couple of other commentators uh, then responded to that and said, well, when Chief Justice Muhammad was appointed to the bench, there was no outcry, even though he was a Muslim. When uh, there was a, a Jewish man appointed to uh, the bench, there was no outcry. Are we saying in South Africa that if you're a Christian and hold Christian views, that you are exempted from any high office in South Africa? Well, that seemed to be the impression sought to be created by some of the commentators. But from where I sit, appreciating the critical importance that our constitution has to pe play in ordering the of affairs of the South African nation, I think anybody, even those who do not believe in anything, as long as they have what it takes to serve the nation well, as opposed to serving or feathering their own interest, ought to be afforded the opportunity to serve, even at the level of chief justice or president. That's in the nature of our constitutional order. And we cannot have a situation where our constitution provides for the recognition or entrenches the people's constitutional right to believe in whatever they choose to believe in, and yet single out some other faiths for exclusion. It cannot be.